Ecclesiastes chapter 12 this morning. We're going to look at the final few verses of the book, 8 through 14. Uh, I shared with the folks Wednesday night, uh, you know, when, when I've read through a book and I've studied it and looked at it and those sorts of things, I, I have to share it with somebody. And uh, one, of the, one of the spiritual gifts is called the gift of knowledge. And those folks that have the gift of knowledge, they enjoy studying just because they enjoy studying. And, and they like learning and they like figuring things out and they like to see what the scriptures are teaching. But not only do they enjoy the study, Brother David, they gotta have somebody to share it with. Well, I've taken the spiritual gifts of that uh, inventory test and whatever you wanna call them. And guess what one of my spiritual gifts the gift of knowledge. So I just got through studying through the book of Ecclesiastes over the first part of the summer, so I got to share it with somebody. You know, so that's why Wednesday night, we, we were in chapter 7 Wednesday night, and uh, this morning we're going to be in chapter 12. There's no way that I could cover the whole book of Ecclesiastes in one sermon, so I'm not going to try to. Because we'd be here for a long, long time. So we're not going there. Years and years ago, Dr. Chuck Swindoll wrote a book on the book of Ecclesiastes called Living on the Ragged Edge. Anybody ever read that book? Oh, wow. I figured there'd be somebody in here that's read that book. So whenever I get my books out of storage, I've got a copy of it somewhere, and I'll have to let you uh, loan it to you. Or you can go to Amazon.com, or you can go to ChristianBook.com, and you can find a copy of living on the ragged edge and it, it's a tremendous uh, basically a series of sermons that dr chuck swindoll taught and preached on the the book of ecclesiastes well the the heat of the summer is here isn't it and uh for for fat boys like me we're just kind of existing right now <laughs> Just get us through it, kind of the, the thing that we're doing. But it is a great day to be in God's house this morning. And uh, we're cool enough in here, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to what God's going to do with us this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I asked a question Wednesday evening, and, and I kind of got some puzzled looks when I asked the question. But I wanted to ask it again this morning. So for you guys that were here Wednesday night, you'll know where I'm going with this. But... When I was looking at, at the topic of wisdom versus foolishness, or as the Old Testament scriptures call it, folly, the question came to my mind, and I just, this is the way I think sometimes. How would you describe a truly stupid person? <laughs> and that's kind of the reaction I got Wednesday night, you know, when I asked that question. But how would you describe a truly stupid person? Well, you know, somebody who's foolish. And the consensus we came up with Wednesday night is that we're talking about a person who goes ahead and does what he or she knows he or she shouldn't do. Yeah. Knowing that the consequences are not going to be what they want, but they go ahead and do it anyway. You ever met somebody like that? And then they wonder... And it happens, and they wonder, why did this happen to me? Well, I told you that if you do that, this is what's going to happen. That's my other spiritual gift, the gift of teaching. See? <laughs> and so when something happens, and I say, you know, look, it's because you did this. That's why this is happening right here. I used to get in more arguments with, with some certain person in my family because I had to tell the children, this is why this happened. And, and I was supposed to be empathizing, and I was supposed to be hacking and saying, this, I'm sorry that happened. And, you know, so I grew up, and, and I got to the point where I could pat, and then I say, this is why this happened. But, but what if we're talking about doing what God's Word says not to do? Well, then we're not only stupid, but we're also a sinner. And that makes a huge difference in what we're dealing with here, wisdom versus foolishness and folly. But then on the flip side of that, how would you describe a wise person? 
To me, a wise person is someone who thinks before they respond to a situation. Someone who considers what God has said on a, on a topic or a subject and seeks God's righteousness as God defines it. You know, the world tells us to seek our own truth. But God's word tells us to seek God's truth. And I'm going to have more to say about that in, in a minute. Solomon, who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, is described in the scriptures. So this is not my description of Solomon. This is how, the, this is how God's word describes Solomon. It, just, it says in 1 Kings that there was none wiser in basically all the known world at the time. That's the description for Solomon. The scripture tells us that he composed over 3,000 proverbs. And he wrote over a thousand songs. Very smart man, very wise man. God had blessed him. In fact, when, when Solomon, as a young man, became king over Israel following his father David, God told Solomon, basically, all right, ask me whatever you want to ask me. I'm going to give it to you. And instead of asking for wealth and riches and fame and prominence, he asked God for wisdom and knowledge to know how to rule such a, a numerous group of people. And God honored that and gave him wisdom that was beyond any other man at that point. And so Solomon, in his wisdom and in his trying to make sense of life, he sought to see where the purpose in life was going to lie, where it, where it was to be found. And he tried all sorts of different things. He, if you were to read the whole book of Ecclesiastes, you would find that he, he tried merriment, he tried pleasure, he tried food, he tried wine, he tried women, he tried all of the different sources of pleasure, he tried knowledge, he tried working, being a workaholic, and all of the labor that he... And you know what he found out? Yeah, those are good things, but... They don't give you purpose in life. They leave you empty. And so one of the recurring phrases in the book of Ecclesiastes is the book or is the term or phrase life under the sun. And when you read that, what he means is he's talking about life here on earth. We live under the sun. So when we're talking about life under the sun, we're talking about the here and now. We're talking about this life, the air that, that I'm breathing, the food that I'm eating, the, the things I'm doing every day when the sun comes up and the sun goes down, what I'm doing, that life here on earth is, is the whole focal point of the book of Ecclesiastes. And there are some people who go crazy trying to figure out where purpose and meaning in life come from. Because they try all sorts of ways. They try all of these ways that Solomon has talked about in the book of Ecclesiastes. One of the chapters in the book that Dr. Swindoll wrote, talking about the workaholic who has worked and endeavored and labored and lost his family and, and everything in the process, but he gets to the top of his corporation and he's sitting at the top, and he looks around, and he realizes that he is all alone. And Dr. Swindoll titled the chapter of that uh, particular book, The Lonely Whine of the Top Dog. Mm -hmm. When you read the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, you're probably going to be kind of depressed when you get through reading it. But if you stop right there, you're going to go crazy. You have to read the whole book in order to understand what life under the sun is all about. There was a fellow, well, he, there is a fellow, I should say, he's still around. There's a Christian comedian by the name of Jeff Allen that I uh, heard about here a couple of years ago. And, and uh, I started watching some of his stuff. Funny guy, I mean, just, just hilarious to, to listen to him. But he is a Christian. And he got saved because of the book of Ecclesiastes. One of the things that he enjoyed doing was playing golf. 
And so he would go down to one of the local uh, golf courses and just play with different people. And there was one fellow in particular that he had been playing with on a regular basis, just in a group that was formed uh, after you get there. And the fellow happened to be the pastor of a church in Denton, Texas. And so he was, the pastor would talk to Jeff about his life and, and things were rocky. He, it was not, life was not good for Jeff Allen at the time. And so the pastor said, I'm going to start sending you copies of, of my sermons on tape. And, and so he started sending him copies of his sermons. Well, he happened to be preaching through the book of Ecclesiastes at that particular moment. And so he started sending, well, as it goes, Jeff's life was just falling apart. He was about to lose his marriage. He was about to lose his family. He was, he, his, his comedian, his comic uh, opportunities were going down the drain as well. And so in a Act of desperation, he finds the tapes, he pulls them out, and he grabs one on Ecclesiastes, and he starts listening to it, and he realizes there's life in these things that he's reading. So he gets his Bible, he, he finds the Bible, he gets that, he starts reading Ecclesiastes, and finally life started making sense for him, and he gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ as a result of that. Just from the book of Ecclesiastes. He finally was led to see the meaning of life is in a relationship with Jesus and he gave his life to the Lord. And so I would like for you to understand something this morning. To be wise, we must hear the words of this wise man in the book of Ecclesiastes, which point us to the Lord. These words that are given by God through Solomon. And so what I'd like for you to do is consider these words about life on earth, life here under the sun. So let's look at the scriptures, and, and I'm going to begin reading in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 8. And we're going to cover these verses, and then we'll go back and talk about them some more at that point. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. The preacher was Solomon's way of referring to himself. All is vanity. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. But that, there's not much hope in that, is it? Pretty depressing. But then he says, in addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge. And he pondered and searched out and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. The words of wise men are like goads, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. That's an important phrase right there, y'all. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless, and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. The conclusion, when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. So there's the conclusion. You, you might say that was Solomon's epilogue of, of what he's saying here in this passage of Scripture. And, and what he's bringing the conclusion to of this particular book. So there's some sets of words here that I'd like to cover with you. Four sets of words. And the first set concerns the, re, the absolute reality of life here on earth. Found in verse 8. What, is it, what does it say again? Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Basically, he's repeating what he said over in chapter 1. In, in all of chapter 1, he talks about the cycles of life. The sun coming up, the sun going down. The, the wind blowing here, the wind blowing there, talking about one person dies, another person's born, and then that person lives, and that person dies, and it's just a cycle of life continuing over and over and over, and he doesn't offer any really hope. Now, what I'm talking about by absolute reality, the word absolute means no exceptions. There, there's nothing you can add to it. There's nothing that can be taken away. It is what it is, absolutely, because that's the way it is in life. And then we talk about reality, and that is how it actually is. So when you put these two together, I think what you need to understand 
is that when Solomon says vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the preacher, that he is coming up with an absolute reality about life on earth, life under the sun. It's very frustrating sometimes, isn't it? Life here on this earth is frustrating. It's full of disappointments. It's full of heartache. It's full of, of trials and troubles. Man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble, as the old phrase and saying goes. So when you look at life and, and you, you earn this money and you make all this money and you're now in retirement and you look around and you say, what was the use of all those years of working? That was one of the things that Solomon dealt with. That was one of the things that Jeff Allen struggled with. What, what, what's all the purpose of life about? Everything is vanity. It's all just... You know, one of these days I'm going to die and, and whatever money I've earned in life, if I have anything in the bank left over, where's it going? So they, I, the word I actually kind of thought of originally was stark. The stark reality of life on earth. So when you look at what he's saying here, and let me take you back to chapter 1, verse 9. <coughs> Chapter 1, verse 9 says, That which has been is that which will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. So there's nothing new under the sun. When someone tells you, hey, this is new and, and exciting, they really don't know what they're talking about because there's nothing new under the sun. The same things that we are dealing with as a, as a society today, they dealt with as a society 2,000 and 3,000 years ago. They're still there. So if a person looks for meaning and purpose in life, in the things found under the sun, that person will be left utterly empty, foolish, and focused on folly. When I was reading through this, uh, I wrote out in the, in the margin of chapter one, I wrote these words, and, I, and I, I tried to sum it up. Life goes on. Sometimes when a loved one dies, we want the world to, and time to just stand still. That we want the world to see our pain, but the world and time keep moving on and on, and we've got to move forward as well. But that's very frustrating sometimes, isn't it? You know, and if you're old enough, you know you've, got, you've had loved ones pass away. I heard a fellow say at one time, he said, you know, I came to realize that I'm old enough to die. <laughs> and, and that's the truth, isn't it? That's the reality. Brother Steve. He thought things were about to get interesting here uh, a couple of years ago on that treadmill over at the hospital. Same way with me here about five years ago in my office at Heaton, Oklahoma. I was having a little heart attack. And, and, and things were getting interesting. In fact, one fellow told me, he, he, he was on the, the local uh, first responders team. He said, I was giving you about 10 more minutes and I was calling the ambulance and rolling it. If, if you hadn't started feeling better in those 10 minutes. So we're, we're all facing death eventually. Because like Steve said the other day, and, and I've said for a long time, there's none of us going to get out of this thing alive. Right. So where does that leave us? Well, the answer to what I'm talking about this morning is, is starting now with, with the second set of words, and that is the resolute goal on life, of life on earth. Verses 9 and 10, back in chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered and searched out and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. Resolute means determined and fully committed to a goal, and the goal is what we are to seek. And, and Solomon had a two-part goal here in his, in his work. He was seeking and exploring wisdom concerning life on earth to make sense of life's utility, uh, according to those two verses. And then the second part is he was wanting to teach people knowledge about life and to, well, I, I just love the ending of verse 12 there, 
where he's saying he was seeking to write beautiful words and words of truth correctly. He had an admirable goal in what he was trying to do. And, and we know that Solomon wrote many Proverbs. He, and he, he, he composed them and arranged them. And, and a proverb is a short, forceful saying stating a general truth or a piece of advice. And there in verse 13, he's wanting to put it into a way that made sense to people so that they could learn what he has been learning. And there's wisdom in that. Having that sort of a goal. There's wisdom in every one of us sitting in this room this morning to try to figure out what life is about because it's going to take you to the eternal. Because if you try to make sense of this life and this life only, it's going to leave you frustrated. You have to go to the eternal. And there's wisdom in that sort of a goal and to teach others what has been learned as well. So, we're frustrated. But if we'll look for the answer correctly, we'll start to find the, the reason for life. And then we come to the third set of words, the flawless guide for life on earth. The word flawless. And, and I, I went through and I was trying to choose these words with, with a meaning to them. The flawless guide for life on earth. Flawless means without error. And reliable theologians refer to it as the infallible guide, the infallible word of God. And the guide, the word guide means the source that's used for instruction on a subject. It's like a textbook or a guidebook or a manual. And, and you want to you want to figure out how to do something. You go to the textbook and, and it provides the instruction that you need. Well, when you look at the flawless guide for life on earth found in verses 11 and 12, it points us in two directions. Number one, it points us to the person that provides the flawlessness. Verse 11. Remember that phrase I told you a moment ago is important? He talks about the one shepherd. It means that what Solomon is writing came from God. What Solomon's writing came from God, the one true shepherd. And so when I think about it, think of it like this. It, this perfect, flawless instruction can only come from one source. And that source is the all-knowing God, the one true and living God, the God of the Bible. When you try to find truth about life from some other source than the Word of God, it's going to leave you empty. It's going to leave you frustrated because it will not make any sense to you and will not help you to understand life anymore. Not only does it point us to the one that's behind the flawlessness, but it also tells us the instruction that guides to the meaning of life. He gives us a couple of word pictures here that describe the Bible. Anybody know what a goad is? A G-O-A-D? A goad? In ancient times, it was a cattle prod. To make the cattle go the direction that they want the cattle, the, the cow or the bull or the ox or whatever it might be to go. And so when they would get a long, heavy stick, staff-like thing, and they would, some of them would have a metal point put on the end that was, that was sharp. Some of them, they'd just take a, a, some way of filing it, and they would sharpen it down to a, to a sharp point on the end of the staff, and they would poke that, that bull in the flank to make it go a certain way. In the way that the farmer wanted that, that animal to go. Well, in, in modern times, if you guys have ever seen one, there, there's a modern cattle prod that's, that's about four foot long. It's, it's got a handle on one end. It's a plastic uh, uh, rod. And then on the other end, there's a couple electric electrodes. Well, in that handle, there's a battery compartment. And when you put that battery in there and you stick those two electrodes to the flank of, or the hip of that animal, guess what's going to happen? Woohoo! They're going to get a good shot. And the farmer uses that to make the animal go the direction that he wants them to go. Because sometimes a bull can be stubborn. Well, a cow can too, but a lot of times we're talking about a stubborn bull. And I, I've, I've had to deal with a few stubborn bulls before. 
literally, uh, helping, helping guys work their cattle. And, and I, I, I've seen what a stubborn bull is like. But this word of God is like a goad. Sometimes it's not real pleasant what the word tells us. We, we feel that shock. We feel that punch. But you can always trust God's word that it's going to make you go in the right direction. The way that you should go. The way that you need to go. And not only is it described as a goad, but then he says the second word picture is, is well-driven nails that provide stability and security. You know what happens if you're nailing a couple of boards together and you leave the nail proud? A quarter of an inch or half an inch not driven all the way in. You know what's going to happen? That joint's going to be weak and it's going to flop and it's not going to be very stable and secure. But if you take that hammer and you drive those nails on in all the way until they're seated into the, to the board, it's a stronger joint. It's more secure. It's more stable. And so what are we talking about here with the Word of God? The Bible provides the necessary foundation to live life under the sun with stability and security. If you're paying attention to the word of God. Now in verse 12, he's also talking about here where we're looking at. Beyond this, he says, be warned. The writing of many books is endless. An excessive devotion to books is wearing to the body. There are thousands and thousands of self-help books out on the market that try to teach you this is what you need to do or this is how you need to live your life in order to, to be better as a person. you got to be careful because if you're spending more time focusing on what the self-help books say rather than reading the Word of God, you're not going in the direction God wants you to go. Right. The Word of God is all you need. Now, if you want to read a commentary to help you understand what you're reading in the Scriptures, great. Find you a strong concordance or a concordance that you can use when you read the Scripture. You don't understand the Word. Look that Word up in the concordance, and it will help you understand that particular Word. A lot of this is online now. So that brings me now to the fourth set of of words that we need to be concerned with. The simple conclusion for living life on earth. So what's that meaning? What do I mean by simple conclusion? Simple means plain, unaffected, and pure. And conclusion is the decision made when all has been heard. Do you notice what he said there in verse 13? The conclusion when all has been heard is to fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person for God will bring every act of judgment every thing which is hidden whether it is good or evil so for the time I have left I want to leave you with four pieces of advice that's found here in these two verses number one or actually this is kind of going to tie in some of Ecclesiastes number one enjoy life here under the sun Enjoy life. Don't fight it. Enjoy it. Look at verse, chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Chapter 2, 24 and 25. There's nothing better for a man or a woman. He's writing in the, in the, the, the uh, third person masculine. And he says, there's nothing better for a man than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? So enjoy life. But if you're going to enjoy life, you've got to have God involved, is what he's saying here. Enjoy life. In chapter 9, verses 7 through 9, he says, Go then. Eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time and let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given to you under the sun, for this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. If you want to enjoy life, just 
Enjoy what God has blessed you with. Contentment with godliness is great gain, Paul says to Timothy. Enjoy your life. Letting the simple pleasures of life carry you from day to day. Not looking for enjoyment in life in ways that go against God's word. So enjoy life. Number two, make the most of every opportunity. Chapter 9, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For there is no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol. That refers to the grave, the nether world. There is no planning, there is no knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. When life under the sun is over, is what he's getting at there. So make the most of every opportunity. Working diligently in what God has led you to do in life. Whatever you do, Paul says, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. So enjoy life, make the most of every opportunity, and number three, hear this one, live life with reverence toward God. You see, God is not concerned necessarily about what you choose to do in life as far as occupation and career and things like that. Yeah, he wants you to follow his leading on it. But all God's interested in is that you be the best whatever you feel led to do and just go with it. Enjoy it, but live with reverence toward God. He says in verse 13 of chapter 12, to fear God. And it does mean a, a godly reverence. It does mean respecting God. But it also carries a note of being afraid of God yeah. because of what God can do. I, I, we were in Hebrew class in seminary and we were talking about the Hebrew word that's translated here for fear. And, and I spoke up and said, well, it's, that's like a reverence for God, isn't it? And my Hebrew professor said, yes. But he said, you cannot discount that in this word is the note of knees knocking together out of fear. Because this is the same word that's used to describe what the Israelites did at the base of Mount Sinai when God's up there and the mountain is thundering and smoking and God's given Moses the Ten Commandments and they're down on the earth at the base of the mountain just terrified of what's happening and, and they, were, they were shaking in their shoes. So we need to live life with reverence and fear for God. No matter what age you are, or age right now, fear God and keep his commandments. Unfortunately, we all grow older. And the wisdom of Solomon here, he tells us in chapter 12, verse 1, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no delight in them. Verse 6, remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. The pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel of the cistern is crushed. What is he talking about? Verse 6, he's talking about death. Well, if you were to read verses 2 through verse 7, I'm not going to read it because I don't want to, I don't want to uh, cause all of you older folks a note of discomfort. Hmm. But what we have in verses 2 through 6 is a description of old age. And it's not a pretty description, let me tell you. I had a guy ask me this week. He said, I notice you have a limp. I said, yeah. I said, unfortunately, it's a permanent limp. He, go, he said, why? Why are you limping? And I told him, that, you know, due to having a couple of blown discs in my low back and, and not getting it fixed quickly enough and now I have some permanent nerve damage and so I have dropped foot on my left foot. You guys may not realize I wear a brace on my lower left leg to keep my toe up or I don't drag my toe trying to walk because of that. And so here's the thing I say that for. 
There are some things that I would do 20 years ago that I just cannot do anymore. And that's true for you, whatever age you are. Eventually, you're going to be where I am. And so you get up in the morning and you, <laughs> and you think, okay, you're sitting on the side of the bed. You think, okay, everything's working. I can stand up now. <laughs> So the wisdom is to seek God, to trust God, to fear God, to reverence God and keep his commandments while you still are able to make the most of it. And then number four, live life as you wish, but keep in mind the future judgment. Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, after this comes judgment. So yeah. Live life as you want. And there was a verse in chapter 11, verse 9. I'm going to close up. Verse 9 says, Rejoice, young man, during your childhood, and let your heart be pleasant during the days of young manhood, and follow the impulses of your heart and the desires of your eyes. So just follow your what's in your heart. Do what, do what you feel God wants you to do. Just remember, he says, that God will bring you to judgment for all these things. So make wise choices. To be wise, we must take to heart the words of this wise man, Solomon, allowing those words to guide us in life under the sun. Let me say it like this. This is this, I'm wrapping it up. In simplest terms, all that matters is to fear the Lord and obey him. Yeah. The New Testament would put it like this. The New Testament would put it as giving your life to Christ in repentance for salvation and serving him the rest of your life. Serving the Lord Jesus means loving God with all your being and striving to do his will in everything and every situation in this life under the sun. When all has been heard, it's all been said and done, as somebody might have put it. Fear God and keep his commands. Where are you this morning in your life and in your walk with the Lord? Are you trusting God? Are you leaning on him? Are you putting him first in your life in every way? That's what, he's being, that's what we're being encouraged to do. I made that decision a long time ago to follow God and to put him first. And that's all I've ever known. Yeah, I've worked some, some jobs when I needed to to provide for my family. But since 1985, I've either been in part-time or full-time ministry since then. Actually, 1984 for a period of time. So it's all I've ever known. And it's all I've ever wanted to know. Trusting God. Fearing God. Reverencing Him and keeping His commands. Do I have a million dollars in my retirement account? No, I don't. But I'm going to be okay. God's going to take care of me. Because I've put Him first. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do this morning. Put God first. In every area of your life. Brother Steve's going to come stand in the altar. I'm going to pray in just a moment. Brother David's going to come lead us in a song. And if you feel the need to talk to Brother Steve. If you need to come trust Jesus as your Savior this morning. Then you, you make that step as soon as Brother David sings. As soon as Miss Barbara plays the first note. You come on out and you come this morning. And you talk to Steve about knowing Jesus as your Savior. And if you need something to pray about, something in this altar, you come down this morning and you get in this altar and you pour your heart out to the Lord. But respond as God's leading you to this morning. Father, I thank you for blessing us. I praise you. I give you the strength and the blessing and the honor that you deserve. God, lead us to put you first in every area of our life. First, first things first, Lord. You are all that matter. And may we seek you and seek your truth in all of our lives. In Christ's name.